Glad right, you got something to eat today. You're going to be fed twice, right? Fed, fed with food and fed with the word and the food of the word. Last week I, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't get Bibles out. So if you want one, they are in that cabinet back there on this side. Uh, and yeah, if somebody wants to grab some and have you distribute some, that'd be great. Uh, last week I mentioned this Chad Bird, who is part of a group called 1517.org. Uh, so that's the, the year of the Reformation. <clears throat> and it, uh, these are <clears throat> Lutheran theologians, and he uh, uh, likes to tweet things out. Uh, and he likes the Psalms. This morning he said this, <clears throat> The Beating Heart of Psalm 23 is the title. Psalm 23... And of course, we know that's the one, the Lord is my shepherd, right? It has 55 Hebrew words in it. What's fascinating is what forms the numerical center of this psalm. At the heart of Psalm 23 are the words, For thou art with me. There are 26 Hebrew words before that phrase and 26 words after it. What's more, in the verses leading up to that phrase, the poet speaks of God in the third person, he does this and he does that. But when we get to this numerical center, the psalmist transitions into speaking to God directly in the second person. For thou art with me, thy rod and staff thou dost prepare. The abiding presence of the shepherd with us, whether we're in the valley of the shadow of death or surrounded by enemies, is the beating heart of the poem. So, thought that was interesting. Yeah. It's interesting how numbers work out, sometimes in the Bible. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with uh, uh, someone would please, if someone would read verses 1 to 4, uh, the first part of verse 4 that ends with words. Would someone read those four from the translation on our handout, please? The heavens declare the glory of God and the work of his hands, the firmament announces. Day by day it pours out speech, and night by night it declares knowledge. There is no speech, and there are no words. The voice is not heard. In all the earth their mind goes out, and to the end of the world their words. Okay. So the psalmist begins by asserting that the creation proclaims, speaks, and imparts knowledge. <clears throat> we had this a little bit last week, but what do you think he's getting at here? What kind of knowledge do, do the heavens speak out? They're the creator. Yeah. I mean, it's too <clears throat> Absolutely. So the creation speaks to the fact that there is a creator. Uh, as Seleska says, the created world presents an argument or makes a case for both the existence and power of God. And last week we looked a little bit at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, which said God from creation has made it plain that he exists, and so therefore no one has any excuse to not believe in God, right? And as we looked at last week, uh, Psalm 14 said, the fool says in his heart there is no God. The fool being someone who is just kind of opposed to God stubbornly, right? Even though there's all this evidence for God uh, right in front of their face. Uh, the heavens <clears throat> tell us not only that there is a creator, but they also speak a message about God, our creator. Uh, what do they tell us about him, do you think? When you look at creation... What can you deduce about him? He's a God of order. A God of order. Certainly. Things work really well, right? Every day that sun comes up, uh, just as it always has, right? For, for ages and ages. He's also powerful, isn't he? A God of power, a God of wisdom, and a God of glory. And you can just sense the, the, the praise in these verses, even as they describe uh, what's happening, okay? You know, it's interesting. Uh, um, my wife is the one that spoke up about what the heavens say about the glory of God. She grew up out in Sydney, Nebraska on a farm. 
Uh, and the heavens look quite a bit different there than they do in the city of Omaha. <laughs> you know, there's some, uh, there's like one light in the farmyard and uh, they could go turn that puppy off at the box, you know, and you, uh, you just lay there and look at the heavens and it is unbelievable, right? Around, if you look up in the, the sky here, you can see maybe, I don't know, 10 stars on a good night, right? There, it's like thousands. And you can see sort of the, the milkiness of the Milky Way. It is just, just amazing. Uh, and yeah, so if you grew up on a farm, or if you're from the country, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, even living in, in Shattered, you can't see the stars like you can see them out there in the farm, no. right? Well, yeah. And I, and I, I, I can see it too. Yeah. But back in those days, there were no lights at night at all, right? To, to dim the, the stars. So, uh, you know, in some ways we've lost that. Uh, and we're a pretty urban society. Something like three-fourths or 80% of the people live in cities. And so, uh, in some ways, this witness to the, the glory of God and his creation has been obscured by urban living. Uh, but there's still a lot of other evidence for God as well. Verses uh, 3 and 4 tell us that the speech that the heavens make is without words. But it still goes out to the ends of the earth. Okay? And Romans 8, 1, 18 and 23 tells us no excuses to not believe in God. But since the, the witnesses to the heavens are without words, they have limitations, don't they? I mean... They don't speak actual intelligible words, right? They just give a witness that there is a creator. Is it enough to know that there is a creator? I know there's a creator. Is that enough? No. No, why not, Alan? Jesus. You don't know about Jesus. You don't know much more about the creator than he exists, right? How does he feel about us? Can I have a relationship with him? Uh, and we know that we are, you know, how do I deal with my accountability since such a creator? Um, what does he know about us? All these kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, one of the things about creation that witnesses to God as well is the fact that we have a conscience, right? Uh, you know, when you were, uh, when you were a kid, you do something bad and nobody's around, you still know it's wrong, right? I remember one time one of my, one of my friends uh, stole a, a baby bird out of a nest or something, you know? Uh, and the mom was chirping at us and I'm thinking, that was wrong. You know, that was wrong that we did that. Uh, and I felt responsible because I was with her. So, um, so yeah, we need to know more about the Creator and, and how do we deal with this accountability we have to Him uh, because our conscience tells us there's a right or wrong and we're often on the wrong side of that. So would someone read uh, from the end of verse 4 that starts for the Son through verse 6 from the translation on our handout. For the Son, He has made His tent in them, and it is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices like a mighty warrior to run the choice. From the end of the heavens, it, it is it going forth, and its circuit is to their end, and nothing is hidden from its glow. Okay, thank you. So the reader has been pondering you know, the implications of considering the heavenly body and his preachers, right? You're, you got that first metaphor, and now you've got Two new ones. You've got the son is itself a bridegroom who comes out of his tent, okay, and a mighty warrior who rejoices to run his courses. So uh, now we've got new images to deal with, and and Celestia says, "I can sense David's excitement." Right? Uh, powerful emotions communicated here about the sun, its beauty, uh, the joy of. Uh, the provision of the sun, the excitement, and the eagerness uh, 
uh, of creation to do its work, and even the love of a bridegroom. Okay, so there's a lot uh, coming at us here. Um, the bridegroom is an interesting image, and we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> Uh, and Celeste writes this, the images suggest that the sun, and along with it, the rest of the created heavens, act in harmony with their creator. The sun does its work willingly, even eagerly. It is happy to do just what God fashioned and desires it to do. Now the sun obviously is inanimate, right? So it doesn't have those emotions. But this is just, I think he's getting at it, it reflects that God's creation does what he wants it to do, and it does it every day, and it does it well, and it seems as if it's eager to do that, right? Uh, so uh, he is really rejoicing in creation. Like I said, every morning, that sun comes up, right? What a, what a beautiful time if you're up in the morning to see that. Uh, and to me, it's a time to just really give thanks, right? I remember when the, uh, when the COVID pandemic hit, uh, and everybody's thinking, what are we in for now? Right? And I came in one morning and I'm sitting at my office and I'm looking out towards Millard South and the sun was coming up. And I thought, you know, this isn't a bad day. <laughs> this is the day that our creator's still on the job. And the sun came up <clears throat> and we still have life and we still have Jesus. And I actually posted about that that day. <clears throat> so. Uh, creation uh, is something to give thanks for, thankful for. You, you take time to rejoice and give thanks for creation. <clears throat> you take time out of your busy life. We talked about living in the city, you know, where we're not surrounded. We, we can't see really the full glory of the heavens because of the city lights. But there are things that we can notice, right? There are a lot of things that we can notice uh, just sitting out in your backyard and enjoying uh, the creation. So, so feed your spirit. You know this. I think this psalm is encouraging us here to feed your spirit with wonder at God's creation, and that's why it's good to read the psalms uh, because they get you into that mindset, right? Uh, that all things were made God, by God. They're very good. They're glorious. They're opportunities for praise. So, <clears throat> good habit to be in reading the psalms. The image of a bridegroom, we talked about that just a little bit. A frequent one in scripture, right? The prophet Isaiah writes in chapter 62, As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Okay, so this speaks to God's love for his people. Uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at a few other passages. Who would read Matthew 9, 15 for us? Would somebody raise their hand? Okay, Jay, you got that one. <clears throat> he said to them, and the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. The day will come, and the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will pass. Okay, thanks, Jay. So Jesus talking about himself as the bridegroom, right? The people were saying, why are you not following all our rules with your disciples? Why are they, you know... Why are they not doing what do we do? And Jesus says, they can fast later after the bridegroom is taken away. So Jesus is you know, talking of himself as a bridegroom. John 3, 29. Would someone read that? This is John the Baptist talking. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The bridegroom thinks the bridegroom waits and listens for him. Okay, so John realizes that his ministry is pretty much over, and people aren't going to be coming to him anymore. They're going to be coming to the bridegroom. And who is the bridegroom? Jesus, right? And he says, I'm like the friend of the bridegroom who has joy at the bridegroom uh, with his bride. Okay, so John knew what his role was, and he talked about Jesus as the bridegroom as well. And then Revelation 21, verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Okay, the, the new Jerusalem, at the end of, the, of all things, 
coming down as a bride prepared for her husband. So the, the people of God, the church is the bride, God is the bridegroom, uh, and the bridegroom loves the bride so much that he would do anything for her. Matthew 25, 1 to 13, I'll let you read on his own. Uh, that's the parable of the virgins and their lamps awaiting the bridegroom. So Jesus, once again, using that metaphor of himself as the bridegroom who is going to come back. Uh, and he, he says, you want to be ready for that. Uh, let's take a look at Ephesians 5, 27 to help us understand how this bridegroom image, what it suggests about God's love. So Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. <clears throat> Somebody read that, please. Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make the body cleansing, uh, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word, and uh, present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. <clears throat> so the bridegroom, Jesus, is used to help husbands understand their role. Uh, this, this goes after the apostle says, uh, wives respect your husbands. Uh, they're the head of the household. And husbands, uh, be like Jesus. Give yourself up for your bride. Okay, Live for her. Uh, really make it your purpose to, to bless her. Uh, and thinking about what Jesus did for the church, he went all the way, right? He, he gave himself up totally. Uh, for her, shed his blood to cleanse her. Uh, that's what he's done for us. And, and so Jesus lived and died for others and he's encouraging the husbands there to, uh, to certainly to be willing to die, but uh, also just to live for their wives, okay? Uh, and you sort of die to self in that way too, right? You're not living for yourself. You die to kind of the simple desires to be served uh, and you serve. And that's true of pretty much any vocation in the Christian life. Let's go on to the next part. Uh, Psalm 19, verses 7 to 10 from Celeste's translation. Would someone read that from the first page? Verses 7 to 10. The Torah of Yahweh is perfect, reviving life. The testimony of Yahweh is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are upright, gladdening the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is brilliant, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is radiant, standing forever. The judgment of Yahweh are true. They are altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, and then much fine, and then much fine gold, and sweeter than honey, and an overflowing store of honey. Okay, so it goes from these uh, metaphor of the sun and what it does. So now talking to switching about talking about the word uh, and giving praise for the word. Um, Selaska so says this, but as C.S. Lewis says, C.S. Lewis, of course, the great Christian apologist, to the psalmist it hardly seems like he is talking about something else because the word is so like the all-piercing, all-detecting sunshine. Okay, so. Lewis sees a transition here that there's continuity in. And he talks about the Torah of Yahweh is perfect. So the Torah, is, you know, is often talked about maybe as the first five books of the, the Bible that Moses wrote. Uh, but also here, Seleska says, it can also be used in a more general sense to just mean the entire written revelation of God. Uh, and including both the doctrines of law and gospel. So it's basically talking about God's whole word here. Um, and um, uh, then he kind of goes more narrow from there, talking about more about the law. You know, things like verse 8, the precepts of Yahweh, the commandment of Yahweh, uh, and the fear and the judgments of Yahweh. So he's really talking about, you know, the, 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 the law of God. Uh, and Lewis uh, is. Uh, very mindful about how exuberant David is here about the law. What does he say about it, right? It's, it's trustworthy, it's upright, it's brilliant. Uh, and he says, I have a little hard time tapping into that much enthusiasm for the law. Because what does the law do? The law is not 
it's really not good news, right? The good news is the gospel uh, of forgiveness. Uh, the law really, uh, you know, he's, well, I, I can understand, he says, how you can assent to it, respect it, uh, and try to obey it, but I, I find it hard to find how you can be, how these things can be delicious and how they can exhilarate. But the psalmist, David, loves the law of God. Why do you think that is so? How can he, how can he love the law of the Lord? It's God's word. It's God's word. It brings you back to where you need to be, and David knew he needed that often enough. Okay, so it has a purpose. It has a good purpose. He sees a good purpose in it. Okay. How about his relationship to the lawgiver? Bible says he loved him with his whole heart. Yeah, he loves God. He loves God so much that he loves even the law, uh, which, <clears throat> which accuses. <coughs> Sorry. So he, it, it, it's a it's a love for God that includes even the love for His Word. Okay, he loves God and recognizes God's will expressed in the law is good, uh, and there's actually. Uh, Joyce hit on it, the purposes of the law are good, okay? So what does the law do? Okay, number one, it shows us our sin. And, and that, in that way, it acts as a mirror. Okay? It also acts as a curb. To curb evil, okay? So everyone's got a conscience, uh, and you know that if you do something, you're going to be accountable to God. Uh, so it basically restrains. Well, yeah, what does a curb do, right? It keeps you from going off the road. Uh, and the third thing is really more once you're like David and you love the Lord, what does it do for you? Not only accuses you, but guide, right, it guides you. So, how am, I, how am I to live? I love the Lord God. He sent his son to die for me. Now, how am I to live? Well, here, God tells me, right? He tells me a lot of good things that I can, if I follow, I know I'm going to be walking in his ways. Okay? So, the law is good. And St. Paul will say that, too. The law is good and perfect, even though he knows that it accuses him that, uh, you know, that he's a sinner, he still knows that the law of God is good. Uh, and, but this love for the law can really only come from, I believe, truly understanding God's grace, right? Uh, once we understand God's grace and his love for us, especially in Jesus Christ, but you know, uh, David, he had received uh, amazing, amazing grace from God. When, as you think about the life of David, when most of all did David receive God's grace? Maybe after the Bathsheba incident? Yeah. Yeah, so he, he sins horribly. You know, he, he sleeps with uh, one of his soldiers' wives. They tries to cover it up, and when he can't cover it up, uh, he gives orders to have that soldier put in the front. Uriah the Hittite, put in the front of the battle, and and then say, and then just sort of abandoned him, and they did that, and Uriah was killed. So he really murdered Uriah as well. Uh, and uh, so David, even though he's called a man after God's heart, uh, did this terrible thing. Uh, but God still allowed him. I mean, he suffered punishments for it. Right? His son, his son died, and God said. Uh, the sword is never going to depart from your house. And as you look at David's life, you know, there were consequences all right along, but God did not destroy him. God allowed him to continue as king. Uh, and so David knew, and if you read Psalm 51, you understand David understood the depth of his sin and God's love. So as those who have received God's grace uh, were transformed. Right, and then we we can live uh, anew, and then we can say, yes, the law of God is so good that I want to follow it. 
Not that I have to follow it. Not that, darn it, it's telling me I can't sin. It's curbing me, right? I can't do everything I want. Uh, no, it's like, yeah, I know I'm a sinner, but I've received God's grace. Therefore, I want to rise to live anew each day in him. Okay. Let's go on to verses 11 and 12 from the translation. Someone read, please. Yea, the servant is enlightened by them, and keeping them, there is great reward. Transgressions, who can discern? From hidden faults, acquit me. Okay, so Celeste writes, in light of the brilliant perfection and beauty of the law, he, the psalmist, becomes aware of his own imperfection, right? He says, I'm enlightened by this law, and I know that I've got hidden faults, I've got secret sins, uh, and God knows everything about me, right? Celeste says, it's like he has walked into a formal wedding reception dressed in dirty jeans and a wrinkled t-shirt. In our culture today, you pray away with that. Right? <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> generally, it's not a good idea. All right, even, even while praising the law, the psalmist feels exposed by it and pleads to God for cleansing from inner and hidden sins. So we all have sins that no one except God knows about. Right? And God knows all, and he still loves us. Uh, and he sent his son to cleanse us for every single sin. God loves you so much that you can't even really understand it or sometimes comprehend it, but it's true. Uh, so we all sin in ways that we're even unaware of as well, right? Uh, and that's why Martin Luther said, Lord, forgive me of all sin. He says, you, you don't have to remember each and every sin because the Catholic Church at the time the church was teaching that if you didn't confess every sin then it wasn't forgiven and Luther's going how can you know them all I'm so sinful that there's some I don't even I'm not even aware of okay so he just says just trust that God forgives and we'll ask him to forgive the sins you don't even know about okay so Celeste also says that the speaker here knows there's part of him that he holds back from Yahweh. Okay? And that if given free reign, he will not follow Yahweh, but do the very opposite. We can relate to that, right, in our sinful nature. And Celeste says the inner tension created by competing loves is the constant experience of all God's children on this side of the second coming of Jesus. Paul gives his own description of it in Romans chapter 7. Let's take a look at that. Romans 7, verses 14 to 25. Somebody read verses 14 through 20 for us. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is true. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Okay, so this this struggle that he that he, that he sees going on, and he, he sin as this sort of force that lives within him that he doesn't want to rule over him, but yet he finds it cropping up again and again. Right? He says, "In my," uh, and he go, goes on a little bit. Uh, let's read the rest of this for, through verses twenty-five, verses twenty-one to twenty-five. So, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, 
waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, <clears throat> but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Okay, so this struggle that's going on, right? You want to do good, you want to follow the law, you love the Lord, but then you, you have this sinful nature that is within you that doesn't love the Lord, that is opposed to the Lord, that is excited by sin. Uh, and when you really understand this, you can, you, it, it really helps you understand what you're dealing with, right? If you're struggling with a sin, you have to understand that this sinful nature in you does not want to obey and is delighted with sin at times, okay? Uh, and sin may make you feel good uh, physically, but it's still wrong, right? And your spirit knows this. And so, you need, you know, it, it helps you in your struggle. And also, uh, I think, you know, helps you to understand that you're never going to be perfect. Uh, but... And, and sometimes we feel like Paul and we say, I'm wretched. Uh, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The reconciliation and the perfection comes from him, right? We don't trust in our own righteousness, thanks be to God. We trust in the righteousness of Christ. Now, does that mean I just go out and sinning and say, well, just let the chips fall? No, right? Uh, and God can help us. Uh, his spirit, his word, uh, and that's why it's really important to be in the word every day, to be in prayer, to stay close to God, because if you don't, that sinful nature will start to start to take over, okay? Uh, so we need to continually uh, get fed, you know, not only with pancakes and sausage like we did today, <laughs> but by the, the wonderful word of God, remembering that it's Christ that we trust in, uh, for our righteousness and not in ourselves, okay? But God can help you, and, and he can bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, you know, the, from Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of those things he can help you develop, okay? And the Spirit will, will bring these fruits out of you over time if you desire it and if you ask God to, to do it. Uh, that's a process that's called sanctification. Right? Sanctification, the, 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 the root of this is holiness, right? Sanct means holy. Sanctification is living the Christian life guided by the Spirit and seeing those fruits come out. Uh, it doesn't have to do anything to do with salvation. We are saved through justification. Justified, set right with God through Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. His death on the cross to pay for our sins. Okay? So, to me, part of the exciting thing about being a Christian is that this is possible. Right? And that this is an ongoing process that God uh, can help me with. And I can more and more follow him each day but because of the promptings of the spirit uh, uh, learning from the word uh, all these kinds of things in prayer um, and uh, if you do this I think you'll see that happen in your life and if it's not happening uh, you know come and talk to me come to talk to your pastor and, and you know maybe we can help you uh, with that um, and you know confess your sins and receive forgiveness each day. All right, so the whole, uh, so we're struggling, and the whole creation is struggling. I see we're about a, out of time here. Uh, but go on to read Romans 8, uh, 18 to 25. That talks about how the creation is groaning until that time when Jesus comes back to set all things right. Uh, we're part of that, uh, and we look forward to the redemption that comes with Christ uh, and 
you know, that as we talk about the heavens speaking, God has spoken to us, as it says in Hebrews, in these last days through his son in a personal way, by coming in the person of his son, dying for our sins, uh, giving us the hope of heaven by his resurrection and his promises. Uh, so we can live each day, even though we struggle, in hope and joy and peace, rejoicing in his creation, rejoicing in his redemption. Uh, so God gives us all we need, all we need in creation for our bodies and lives, all we need for salvation through his son and in his word, which teaches us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your father, uh, for your goodness to us. Father, we thank you for your fatherly goodness and sending your son. Uh, and Lord, just help us each day to rejoice, to rejoice in your goodness, to bask in the grace that we've received through your son. Uh, and help us like David uh, just to, to respond in love for you uh, by living uh, for you each day, living uh, for others, not living for ourselves, uh, trusting you uh, and following you more and more each day. Uh, we thank you for Jesus, the one who cleanses us from all our sin. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Next week we're going to do Psalm 22.